the first part, uh, part of class, we're actually just going to talk about the paper. This is the start of Unit 2, just like we did with Unit 1. I want to start by thinking about what are we even writing about? What do we need to be thinking about while we're reading what we're reading, while we're talking about what we're talking about? And then with the last little bit of class, we're going to briefly get into the book. Again, with the first day, I'm not going to ask anything too intense. For the most part, what I want you to leave class with is some kind of foothold in the book, because I know some people in particular just struggle with figuring out what even is going on in this damn thing. It's not as tricky as it seems if you're, if you're in that boat right now, I promise. But we'll talk about it. All right, to begin with, paper two is what's called an, uh, an informative synthesis essay. Basically, if you were asked at any point in high school to write a research paper, chances are very good you wrote something like this. And I say it like that, that's a backhanded compliment because our next paper in unit three is actually going to be a research paper. But this is a nice stepping stone to that. All right? Before we get to what any of that means, the kind of minutia up front. Source text. We're going to use Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five, this book. A couple notes on that. I've mentioned this before. It was published in the 60s, so it's kind of old. But it's also kind of famous. So it's been printed many times. Um, this is a, a more recent copy, this cover. Uh, but if you have an older edition, it might be brown with like a big V on it. Uh, there, there are older editions than that. I say this because some of you will find a different cover and it will scare you off. It's fine. If it says Kurt Vonnegut, Slaughterhouse Five, you got the right book. Okay? Um, other things to know, there's different sizes to the book. Again, I know that this is a weird way to start class. But I point that out because we're going to use page numbers when we talk about different things going on. And if you have like a smaller uh, copy, for instance, your page numbers will be different. And we'll just have to figure that out as we go. Okay. So we're using Vonnegut. We're also using a secondary source I've provided. This is on Course Den. It's an article by a woman named Christina Jarvis. We're not talking about that yet. We're not reading that yet. But it is there for you when we get to it. Okay? That's two of our sources. The other two sources you're going to find on your own. And again, we're not doing that yet. We will get there. But those are our four sources for this paper. Okay, Vonnegut, Jarvis, two that you find. The length is at least four pages, not counting the work cited. Um, and again, I know some people freak out, like, oh, this paper is longer. But again, we're reading an entire book. You're going to have three articles, two of which you find. More often than not, people do not have a hard time filling up four pages, right? You got plenty to draw from for four pages. It's twenty percent of your grade uh, format, same as always. MLA. We will talk about work cited during this unit. I know you're excited. And then the final draft will be due in week ten. That's the seventeenth of October. So we actually have a little over a month to get all this stuff read, get the papers written. We got some time. Now, why do I phrase it like that? I like to talk to you a lot in this unit about structure. The unit itself is structure. We have two halves, okay? We're starting the first part of the unit today, and that is we just have to read all this stuff. We've got to read a book. We're going to read an article. You're going to find a couple other articles. You're going to read those. Hopefully, you're going to take some notes while you're doing some of that. We've got to get all this stuff read so that in the second part of the unit, we can write about it, okay? So you'll notice for this week, if you look at the syllabus, there's no homework other than reading. We just have to get the stuff read right now. That's enough. Now what the paper is, kind of along those lines, I like to put it this way. You're gonna hear me say this a lot. This paper is a conversation between texts, okay? So invariably, somebody's going to ask me, hey, but what are we doing? And I'm going to say, we're putting these texts into conversation with one another. This is a novel. It's kind of long by some of your standards, right? All kinds of things happen. All kinds of ideas are presented. Arguments are made. What have you. Write those down when you notice them. When you go to read Jarvis, she's going to make some arguments, some observations about this book. So those are going to be pretty easily put into conversation with one another, right? 
But any other two articles you find might be about other things. But chances are very good they're going to have some ideas, some arguments that somehow tie into either Vaudiant or Jarvis or both. And I want to see you tie those together, right? That's how the paper is going to work. Questions at this stage? Okay. So to better illustrate that, there's a, a few more sections to this prompt. First of all, a note on sources. As I mentioned, I give you two of them. I give you Vonnegut and Jarvis. The two that you find need to at least consider this section. And I say consider for an important reason. But I give you all kinds of examples that we will talk about when we get there about viable scholarly or secondary sources you can use. Okay. Most of you will, will use something like this. Okay. But... I have made exceptions to this rule in the past. I think it was like a year ago I was teaching this class. A student approached me with a blog that she wanted to use. I'm not a fan of using a blog for this kind of a paper. But she sent me a link. I read it. It was really good. I was surprised. So I made an exception, right? So all that is to say, if you find a source you really want to use and it doesn't fit this description, let me see it. I'll change my mind. I'm cool with that. But I, I need, we need to talk about those if it doesn't fit this description, okay? Because this is like the traditional scholarly source stuff. Suggested thesis. This will actually help us think about what I mean when I say a conversation. So, I keep using the, the term conversation. It is not unlike if you walked into the room and four of your friends... <clears throat> We're talking to each other, okay? And you just showed up in the middle of that conversation. If they were going to catch you up, get you on the same page with them, they would have to introduce you to the conversation, yes? They'd have to tell you, oh, this guy doesn't like Tiffany, but these people, blah, blah, blah. Like, there's going to be a couple different topics that have come up. Well, that's your introduction. And when it comes to a thesis, if someone tries to sum it all up, it's going to sound a little bit like this. While everyone seems to agree about this one particular idea, whatever it might be, right? The topics of Y and Z provide further room for debate. Now, again, I know some, if not all of you, are basically going to copy and paste that, which bums me out. But I'll tell you right now, places like this provide more room for debate. That's, that's the section where you can get more specific. You can tell me what that debate looks like, why there's more room for debate, something like that. Okay. Lastly, then we're done with the prompt. I'm also going to say this a lot. This paper is all about organization. We have four texts that we're going to talk about for four pages. Your number one job is just going to be structuring the different ideas that you, you decide to talk to me about. Okay. You're going to have to get them talking to each other, but you're going to have to organize that in a sensical fashion. So that's job number one for you. We're not really making arguments in this paper. So the good news is if you felt like you struggled with that, with the previous paper, you get a little reprieve here. That's not to say we're not going to use all the same skills. We're not going to use the same structures because we are. You're still going to have to have topic sentences and evidence. You're going to build an introduction like we talked about. Okay, All that's still here, but you're using it in a slightly different way. In terms of organization, there are two primary modes for this kind of a paper. And I will talk to you about both, but I'm going to caution you against the first one. And I'm going to give you the names of these, but you don't need that, okay? The first is a block format. You guys love block format because of this. You just summarize each source. Let me see. It's four pages. I get an introduction and a conclusion. I'll just summarize each source in its own paragraph. Boom, I'm done, right? The problem with that is that it's very hard to do well. It's not impossible. I've had a few good papers in block format. But the reason it's difficult is because it puts so much pressure on your transitions. Like your transition game has got to be on point. Because keep in mind, the whole, the whole main idea of this paper is to put those texts into conversation, like I keep saying. 
the only place they can converse, if you do it this way, is between paragraphs. So you gotta crush it every time between each paragraph. That can be difficult. Not impossible, but difficult. For that reason, I teach alternating format. Okay? And again, the names are not important for you. But the way we talk about the paper when we talk about it in class is you summarize topics, the conversations around each idea. Okay? So for instance, among other things, this is a war novel. Probably more fair, fair to say an anti-war novel, right? That topic is absolutely going to come up in Jarvis in a couple different ways. It could, if you want, come up in the other articles you find. So that particular topic, that particular part of the conversation, maybe that's your first body paragraph, right? Depending on what other ideas you find in here or your other, your other sources, that might be your next body paragraph. When you do it that way, when you structure it around ideas, that just makes it easier to get these texts talking. Okay? So that's how I teach the paper. That's how we're going to talk about it. You can try it this way. It just, in my experience, tends to go better when you do it this way. Questions about anything so far? Cool. We're going to do next. <clears throat> We're going to practice a little bit of sentences. So what this is going to look like. I'm not trying to throw shade, but I'm going to throw a little bit right now. My last class didn't do so well with this. This is one of the easiest things I will ask you to do this semester, and I mean that. So, yeah. Basically, we're going to watch a 20-minute video. It won't feel that long. Probably. We're going to watch a 20 minute video. This is from a show called Last Week Tonight. You may not be familiar with it. We watch different things. It's okay. <clears throat> but in this video, uh, the guy, uh, John Oliver is his name, he's going to walk us through the kind of debate around whether or not student athletes should be paid. Okay? He is firmly on the side that student athletes should be paid. But the reason I like this video is because he really does give you both sides. So he's going to give you reasons why he thinks they should be paid, but then he's going to give you reasons the NCAA gives that they shouldn't be. What that's going to allow us to do, if you take notes as we go, whenever you see an idea or an argument being made, we're going to get that stuff up on the board, and we're going to practice a little bit of synthesis. Okay? All right. So what I'm going to do now. You just get some of that up on the board. So what we have right now, basically we have two texts we're thinking about, right? We have the NCAA side of things on, on uh, reasons they give for why student athletes shouldn't be paid. And then we have the other side, uh, which is basically John Oliver saying all the reasons he feels like they should be paid. What are some things you guys noticed? Yes? Well, on this side, you yeah. said that, you know, oh, they're amateurs. Yeah. Well, that. And they keep, uh, Mark Emmert, the guy they keep cutting to, uh, he's the president of the NCAA, okay? He keeps uh, really emphasizing this, right? Especially that side of it. At one point, he repeats, they're student athletes, you know, they're students. The argument he's making there is, yeah, they're at, but first they're students, they're like you guys. It'd be the equivalent of someone saying, well, we should pay you guys for coming to class. Now, you may, you may agree with that, I don't, but, I mean, fundamentally, that, that would be kind of weird, right? Like, to pay you for showing up, that does, it's school. So he's, he's trying to use that phrase to, to accentuate the fact that they're amateurs. Yeah. Okay. What are some other things you guys notice? Where's... We're not doing any work yet. We're trying to fill up this board a little bit. Reasons they should be paid, reasons they shouldn't. Yes, ma'am? Another thing that they have on the side is mm -hmm. they're compensated with their education. You keep putting the quotations up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, this, uh, this idea of an education, right? Good. This, uh, this side has a direct response to that one, actually. 
Um, what's one of the issues with that question of an education? They never have time to do their schooling. So one, uh, Richard Sherman talks about their schedule, right? Sounds pretty insane. Sounds like it would be difficult, if not impossible, right, to to pursue any kind of a meaningful education. Yes. Paper classes. Those paper classes, and, and just to be clear, so we all understand that term, what they're saying there is those classes existed on paper, like they weren't real. They just like, and again, from that from the kids' perspective, if you're like, hey, you don't have to go to this class, I'll be like, yeah, I'll probably do that. I understand, right? But it's the administrators or whatever just saying, look, we're going to fix your grade so you can play. Don't even. And yeah, practices like that, though hard to say how widespread they are, further question this idea of like, what kind of an education are you really getting? Um, more pervasive than that, and I'm not trying to throw shade at anyone, so I'm not going to name majors, but I'll even get student athletes sometimes, and like, I'll look at their major, like, I know a lot of the time people are steered into easier majors. Like, take this, take, take this major because it's easy. And it's like, I know why they're telling you that, and I understand that that's not terrible advice on the one hand, but on the other, this is fucking school, right? Like, if you're not necessarily here just to, to, to do a bunch of easy stuff like that, right? So it, there, there's a problem there, too, uh, that kind of goes there. Okay. Other things you guys noticed. What about um, old Dabo, uh, the cleansing coach? He's in the orange gear. He uses a particular term that you guys might might have heard before. Yes, ma'am. Like entitlement. Entitlement. I'm a millennial, so I have to hear it a lot. You guys are Gen Z. I imagine you've heard it a lot. If you haven't, you will. What does he mean when he says that? That they're entitled. What's he arguing? Wasn't he talking about how, um, since they're not like professional players? Yeah. I was taking that as like maybe he, the players wouldn't try as hard because they had nothing to work for in the professional league. Like they would be seen as professional players since they're being paid. Oh, well, in a way, kind of. I mean, that's not strictly what he's saying, but that, that, that might be part of the larger conversation he's, he's trying to imply. But like, you guys have never heard this term before? Like, to say someone is entitled? Yeah. What does that mean when somebody says that? Basically like you have a chip on your shoulder, like you think you deserve something without working for it. You feel like you're owed something like automatically, right? And yeah, with this idea of like not working for it and not earning it in some way. So he, when he says that, what he is saying is basically, that these student athletes haven't earned the money that they're they're perhaps asking for. They feel entitled to it. Cool. I mean, not cool. Fuck that guy. But you know, cool. What else we got? What about? Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, the immense like spending, like like weird spending to like keep their nonprofit back. Or and we can kind of put that on both like so so this side would say they're nonprofits, right? And this this is true, like I mean we're not a division one school, so I imagine we don't like I've never been to a football game here. I have children that go to bed at seven o'clock at night. But if you guys have, I know you have this semester, I imagine it's not a packed house, so we're not bringing in like big money. But division one, like I went to Alabama. Real talk, the, the COVID stuff. One of the articles I read when it first kicked off and people weren't sure if we're gonna have football or more, more specifically, if people were gonna be allowed in games, the city of Tuscaloosa, that's where <clears throat> University of Alabama is, the city was gonna lose, uh, uh, I'm not gonna get the number right now because it's been a while since I read it, but millions of dollars this football season. The city itself like was gonna use, lose a couple million dollars per game. There's like, seven or eight games in the city every uh, football season just from people coming in and buying stuff, going to restaurants, staying in hotels. The whole city was going to lose that money, right? So the school is also making a whole bunch, but, but Alabama, too, has to get rid of that money somehow. 
So this side would say, well, how nonprofit are you really? Because you bring in a ton of money, it's kind of hard to. And Alabama is very good about getting rid of that money too. A whole lot of building on that campus, pretty much constantly. Let's get a couple more up here. Let me see. I can do an easy one. Uh, this side would rightfully argue that when you sign up to play, you you agree to a set of rules, right? That is fair. But this side also has a direct response to that, which would be what? The rules are ridiculous. It's 440 pages. No one is reading that. No one is ever reading that. That's bananas. Yeah. Okay. What else? Uh, ooh, let's talk about coaches. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was thinking for like the money side, like yeah. the players' health. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, there's a couple different ways. Uh, specifically, you're talking about the kid from Oklahoma. Um. What are you yeah, thinking about? Yeah, and I was thinking about the one where the kid was being interviewed and he said he had. Yeah. Pain. Yeah, 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 and I like to lump that one under. He says that he goes to bed hungry, right, starving. And then expected to play like that. Yeah, this, this question of human needs. Like, another thing that gets kind of lost in this phrase, student athletes, is that they're also human beings that have to, like, eat and maybe would like to live inside. Like they, so we live in America. We live in a place where, like, you have to have money to, to meet some of those basic human needs, and that can be difficult. In certain situations. Okay, good. What was I saying? Oh, the coaches. So this side, it, it, it's kind of implied uh, that this side would argue uh, something else is offered to a student athlete from their coaches. What do these coaches offer? It's an M word. Mentorship, right? I know. But this, this idea that you're not just getting an education scholastically, but you're going to go under the wing of this person who's going to uh, teach you like character building stuff and life stuff. And again, I'm not saying that can't happen. I'm, I'm definitely not saying that the stuff we saw in the video is every coach, right? Those are hyperbolic examples. But I did also grow up, my dad was a football coach. You're fine. Go ahead and rip the band off. Um, my dad was a football coach. That's 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 what it was like. So I thought, in my experience, a lot of them are actually that way. So that's interesting. Okay. What else we got? I'm sure we're missing a couple. This side would suggest that when you're done, you can just go pro. Right? The probability of that is very slim. Slim to none. Yeah, yeah. Not likely. Less than 2%. Um, what else? What else? I just want to get a couple more up here if we can. Oh, we didn't uh, do this one specifically. He references this uh, a couple times in a couple of different ways, but also this question of advertising. Especially if you ever watch uh, any sport, college or professional, uh, but even in movies you guys are into now, like there's a thing called product placement. They'll, they'll drive a particular kind of car, or there might be a weird drink that's like in the background. Like there's all kinds of ways people work advertising into things. Sports are no different. Um, and then he talks about the video games and, and all manner of other things. Yeah. Anything else? I guess that's about it. That's pretty good, I think. Yeah, that's good enough. Okay, so what we have right now, and again, this is just an example for how we're gonna approach the paper. This is basically two texts. This is one side of like the debate. This is a text. This is another side, okay? So these are our two texts. What we're gonna start to do, try to do right now, is just connect different parts of the conversation or different ideas together. So how can we do that? Can you guys see any connections we could just start to make between the two sides? Put them into conversation with each other. It seemed like we were starting to do this earlier.
talk to me about education. NCAA says they don't get paid money, but they get paid in an education. So what's one way this side might respond to that? The education is not going to anything because it's like the paper classes and they're Severely not watered down, right? Yeah, we have the direct response. Okay, good. Any other ways we could, we could speak to that idea of an education? Is it really a nonprofit if they have to spend all their money like frivolously? What do you who who's spending their money? The colleges. Is it really a nonprofit if they're buying random expensive stuff? Uh, okay, well you jumped to a different but yes, yes. Alright, so there's that too, that direct response. But still this thing. I think there's more we could do here first, and then we could maybe go to that. Can we speak to anything anything else on this side? Can that speak to this idea of an education in some way? Um the schedule. Yeah. Again, we kind of talked about this earlier, but the idea that even if you're not in made-up classes or bullshit majors, no shade, I don't, I don't remember if I'm coming to you, but even if you're not doing that, the schedule for most student that seems to prohibit learning much of anything. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Um, even with the education. Yeah. There's no at-risk of losing it. They, I'm sorry. What'd you say? With the education, they still have at risk of losing that education once they get in, like injured. Yeah. Because most of them are like on sports scholarships. Yeah, and they can lose that if they're injured and they take the scholarship away. Yeah. So what did we just do? We basically just outlined, if we wanted to, the start of a body paragraph, right? Say we start that body paragraph with the one-to-one. -one. We offer an education, uh, not all the time, actually. Sometimes they're made up classes, sometimes they're bullshit, you know. Cool. Beyond that, this side will also say, even if you do sign up for real classes, right, the schedule seems to prohibit pursuing it. And even if you do somehow master that, the fact that your body, your knee, something could give out at some point, they take your scholarship away, right? So how much of this are you really getting? And there's all these different ways we could sort of continue that conversation. This could go further, by the way, if we wanted to. But the point I'm making to you is that might be our first body paragraph, right? And we see these connections and we follow some more if we want, but then we sketch that out to the side like, all right, I, got, I can start my paper with that now. Let's do one more. Maybe we'll do this because we kind of brought it up already. So this side, again, nonprofit. The other side would say, ah, but how nonprofit are you really? That's kind of our direct response to that idea. Are there any other uh, ideas that we could bring into that conversation up here? Advertising? Yeah, how so? Because looking at this advertiser and like the revenue of the colleges are getting, like how are you a nonprofit when you're profiting off of the players? Yeah, it's, it's like there's so much money, like it, 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 it seems pretty unlikely that you're a nonprofit to be, to be pulling in those kind of numbers. Sure. Especially with like Division One football and basketball. Yeah. What else? What are some other ideas we could we could bring into the conversation? I mean we could bring because you you brought up that um, for like because of the society that we live in, which is you know, the capitalist society. Uh -huh. The whole, you know, for human needs, basic human needs a lot of times it's like you have to use money. But a lot of times the players don't have money. Like yeah. It could change if they actually pay the players. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I'm trying to figure out how we. I, I'm, I'm not disagreeing. I'm trying to find, like, connect that a little stronger. I mean, to me. Hmm. The student athletes, their needs get compromised. You can connect the student athletes, but I'm not a student with too many needs. The fact that we're not appreciating that they're human yeah, beings. Yeah, they do little ones. In okay. Terms of making profit. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So maybe you. Hmm. All right. One thing we could do. I think I could find a backdoor to what you guys are talking about. What we could maybe do, uh, for instance, talk about advertising. How they're they're obviously tying all kinds of advertisements into the game, which Oliver points out. You know, there's nothing like inherently wrong with doing that. But in doing that, you're admitting that the student athletes are a product, right? They're putting a product sort of on television. So you could say, well, this side would argue you're ignoring 
that, right? You're using that term to do it, um, and you're further pretending that your profit or lack of profits um, has nothing to do with the fact that you guys are human beings. Yeah, sure. And here again, we started very quickly, you guys did, made all manner of connections, and maybe that would be our second body paragraph, right? That's how you begin to build this paper, right? And understand, too, this is just two texts. For you guys, you would have two more right next to these. So you might have lines coming over here and then one going back. And it'd be a big mess. Not all of these would pan out. Not all of these would be a good idea. But you just kind of have to play with it to see, right? So what I'm going to recommend to you as we go forward, as you read more of the book, once we get to other sources, other texts, and I mean this, Take some notes. They don't have to be super detailed. But especially if something, like I keep saying, strikes you as interesting, or you notice a particular idea, or a theme, or God forbid, even an argument, jot that down. Maybe give yourself a page number where you saw it, so you can go back if you need to later. And then at some point in the process, I have seen students do this in the past. You do not have to. I've seen people line it up just like this. Just get them all in front of you. Because by the time we're done reading, we're going to have a book. We're going to have three articles next to it. That's, that's kind of a lot to just hold in your head. So any way you can list it out a little more simply, it's going to help you make those connections. And that's how the paper works, basically. Any questions about any of that? All right. What time? Sweet. We got a little bit of time. We're going to talk about the book. Just a little bit. Um, again, oh, that's not great. Oh, well. This is the part of class I'm kind of scared about. Because my last class, let's be real, didn't read. Um, let's see how you guys do. All I want to do today, I've only had you read two chapters, is make sure everybody kind of understands how the thing works. Right, because some people get really tripped up uh, by like the narrative structure and things like that. So, like I mentioned in the video which I shot in my son's bedroom, those of you who watched it may have noticed an R2D2 pillow behind me. That's not mine. Um, he loves Star Wars. This book has a frame narrative. There are ten chapters. The first chapter and the last chapter is like a story that occurs outside the rest of the story if that makes sense. So if you read the first chapter, and then you read the second chapter, and you're like, who the hell are these people? That, that's totally fine. What I'm telling you is, from chapter two all the way through chapter nine, you're gonna be in that, that's one story, okay? And then when you get to chapter 10 again, you're gonna be back to that frame. You're gonna be back to the story outside the story. All right? that's the first thing I want you to understand to help make this book make a little more sense. The second thing I want to talk to you about, we're going to talk about in a minute. First, I want to get some characters on the board. So I mentioned that there's basically two stories, so there's basically two sets of characters. In chapter one, do you guys remember any of the characters we encounter? Who do we meet in chapter one? Is that the chapter where he goes and visits his buddy? Yes. Do you have to remember any of those folks? Not their names. Ah, okay. Uh, well, I'll give you his buddy. <clears throat> Bernard B. O'Hare. We each call him O'Hare. He is a war buddy. He's a soldier. Can anybody describe this guy? Like, what's his deal? What are some things you know about him? We don't, we don't learn a lot. He's married. He's married to a woman named... Oh, it's so easy. He's married to... This worries me. You guys can read two chapters a day. That's really troubling. You're going to be in a lot of trouble. He's married to a woman named Mary. Yeah, that's what I thought. Cool. Today is going to be brutal. I got one more class after you guys. I 
bet they didn't read either. It's gonna be fun. Um, damn, I hate doing this. All right, show of hands, who read both chapters? How many we got? I just want to know. One. Fuck. All right. Put your hand down. <sighs> okay, I can run through this in a in a really sad way. Okay, so O'Hare, the war buddy of the narrator. The narrator, by the way, is a character in the book, especially in chapters one. And ten, he is a part of that story outside of the story. He's both telling the story that you're going to see through the whole book, but he's also in it occasionally, and he'll tell you. He'll, he'll tell you when he's there. He's pretty silly, the narrator. Um, O'Hare, interesting thing about him, he's a war buddy. The narrator drives to see him to talk about the war. He wants to share stories. He finds out O'Hare doesn't want to talk about it. He doesn't want to talk about the war. And it's like, that's the whole reason he goes. So that's kind of interesting. These guys fought in World War II. It was kind of a big deal. They were in some pretty famous battles. They saw some real shit. But O'Hare claims, I don't remember any of it. That tells you something about O'Hare. I'll leave that to you when you get there. Mary does not care for the narrator. And I'll read a little bit at you. Uh, I think I had it marked and I took it out. That sucks. The page is not. Hang on. My notes here. Page 18. Yeah. All right. So Mary doesn't care for the narrator. And he finally asks her why. She says, what are you going to write the book about? He says, I don't know. So then she responds, well, I know. You'll pretend you were men instead of babies, and you'll be played in the movies by Frank Sinatra and John Wayne or some of those other glamorous, war-loving, dirty old men. And war will look just wonderful, so we'll have a lot more of them. And they'll be fought by babies like the babies upstairs. So she's suspicious of the narrator. What kind of book does she think he's going to write? talks about Frank Sinatra and John Wayne. Those aren't writers. What does she worry about? I think he's going to write like a screenplay kind of. Yeah. Frank Sinatra, John Wayne, these are movie stars. Action heroes in some way, you know, back before we necessarily had that term. But he's going to write a book that in some way is going to feel like one of those war movies, you know? It makes it seem better than what it was. It makes it seem cool. Yeah. We don't have as many war movies today, but you may have seen a couple. I don't know your life. But you've definitely seen like an action movie, you know. The body count is sky high. But it looks cool as shit. You blow away some people. You pick up a girl along the way. She loves you for some reason. And you just kind of, it looks great. I'll sign up for that. Sure. This kind of movie we're talking about, right? Mary doesn't appreciate those stories. And she assumes that the narrator is here to do that. Is here to get O'Hare's stories from him and kind of twist them in a way to make them seem more glamorous, she says. Okay? So in some ways, and this, this oversimplifies her, but I mean, these are also just notes on a board, right? She works as a kind of moral compass in this first chapter. She kind of checks the narrator. She makes sure. She's like, what are you in this for? What are you trying to do? And he promises her that, she's, that he's not going to do that. That's not what he's about. <clears throat> and again, I'll leave the rest of their discussion to you guys when you get there. The narrator, as I've mentioned before, he and O'Hare were soldiers in World War II. Okay. He wants to write about the war. That's as far into that as we can go without you guys having read. But it's important to him that he writes this book. Okay? At one point, he says he's thrown out like, uh, oh, I'm not going to get the number right. He's thrown out 
like 5,000 pages or something like that, trying to write a book about what he saw. So it's important to him that he does it. And in some ways, it's important to him that he does it right. And it's that question of what, what right is here that you guys are going to have to think about as, as we go. But it's very important to the narrative. He gets the story right, whatever that means. All right. In chapter two, we meet, I guess, two more characters, really. <clears throat> Billy Pilgrim and Roland Weary. Their last names are super intentional, by the way. Pilgrim and Weary. Pilgrim is a traveler. Weary is tiresome. He makes you tired. Where's chapter two start? Mm, late 20s, early 30s, let me see. If anybody has the book on them, I'd really appreciate you opening it. Damn, that's really troubling too. Okay. Jesus. So if you have the big book, which it seems like you do, here on page 29, that's the start of chapter 2. Could you read to the end of that first sentence for us? The list in Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck in time. Yes. That's how we meet Billy. Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck in time. What the hell does that mean? That is really odd, right? Now, I'm assuming some things, given our, given our earlier number and given the fact that you were the only person to pull the book out. Uh, do you have a suspicion or do you have an idea about what being unstuck in time means? Mm, being unrealistic with what's happening. He got a day drink in That's one way to put it. So, and this will become clearer the more we read, like deeper into the book. There's some, I don't want to give anything away here, there's some, some very hard sci-fi elements to the book that will throw you a little bit, just roll with it. But basically, when we say Billy is unstuck in time, the book, especially from chapter 2 on, is going to move a lot. You're going to start with Billy, he's going to be in World War II. Uh, behind enemy lines, all right? He's in Nazi Germany. But then you're going to go to his childhood, and then you're going to go to when he's an older man. He has a family himself. You're going to go back to World War II. You're going to jump all around, okay? That's because, well, one of the reasons is, according to the narrator, Billy is unstuck in time. You guys right now are stuck in time. It's called time's arrow. It moves in one direction, all right? So right now, you're stuck in this class. But after that, you're going to go wherever you would normally go after this class. And after that, you might go, according to Richard Sherman, get yourself a quick bite to eat, right? And then after that, maybe you go to another class. And then after that, maybe you go see your friends, right? And you're going to go until you go to bed. You're going to get up in the morning. You're going to do that whole thing. You're going to move in one direction in time. You're stuck in time, okay? Billy is unstuck. He goes all over, all the time, back and forth. The important thing I want you to take away from that Number one, the book is going to do that. So you got to kind of be on your toes. I wouldn't read this book when you're tired. But number two, he's not a time traveler. That's something students will sometimes uh, misunderstand. Time traveler implies that you have control, okay? If you've ever seen Back to the Future or any other movie where people travel in time, they tend to have a button they push or something. None of that for Billy. He does not have control of this. He goes in and out of different things all the time. No control over it, though. And that's an important aspect of his character because he is also quite possibly one of the, if not the most, apathetic characters of all time. Like, some of you may feel truly apathetic right now. He is, like, at one point, I think it's in chapter two, he leans against a tree and just sincerely wishes he could turn into steam. Like he just wants to evaporate. So the whole book, he's just getting pushed around different places. That's who Billy is. 
supremely apathetic. And that might be important. Yes, ma'am. Um, with the apathetic and unsatisfied yeah. teachers, there's an example they think about um, like trauma and PTSD. Yeah, well, there is a question of that in the book. The two things I would say there is number one, that is a conversation that can be had. Like, I'm not going to say that's not there. But we also can't have it without reading the rest of the book, just for everything that happens. But the second thing I would offer is that, much like I kind of answered people when we brought up PTSD with little boy, I worry that if we simply say that, we kind of kill the rest of the conversation. Like, we miss a lot about Billy and, and the other people in the book and, like, what they lived through. Um, but the one thing I'll say, because I don't want to spoil it, there's a lot that happens in this book. The book allows for that possibility. The questions of like PTSD. It allows for that. But, and we will talk about it, there's other sides of that conversation that complicate it a little bit. All right. <clears throat> Last character. Roland Weary. He's a fun guy. Uh... How to sum him up. He, he hangs out with Billy in chapter two. They're both behind enemy lines, so they're a pretty fraught situation, right? Weary, how best to put this? Well, I'm gonna kind of put you under the bright lights again. Weary has a hobby. Do you happen to remember his hobby? He's really into this one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Not specifically. Okay, very memorable. I don't know, you taught me about it. Ah, what's he into? Torture. Torture! Weary loves torture. Loves talking about it. He has a favorite style of torture that he's invented, you know, like you do with your friends. What kind of torture do you like, right? So he's, he's really into torture. Learn a little bit of something about him. If you met a guy, and within the first 20 minutes, he wants to start talking to you about torture, you form a certain opinion of that guy, right? That's weird. So, look forward to him. The other thing you get to know about Weir in chapter 2 is he hates being ditched because he's always getting ditched. He's getting left behind by people. I can't imagine why. I mean, he loves torture, right? Now, there's more to say about these people, obviously. But, again, this is our very, very, very brief summation, sort of roadmap of the first two chapters. Again, the other things I want you to take away from this class, it's going to move a lot, especially in chapter two on. The book is going to jump all over the place So you got to be on your toes. I wouldn't read the book when you're tired. If you need to take a break occasionally, take a break. Give yourself some time. It does read quickly, I promise you. Um, some of you may be scared when you look at, at the book. It reads pretty fast. There's a lot of dialogue. Um, it's funny at times. It's weird at times. But just give yourself enough time to actually read through the thing. I would recommend taking notes as you go. If you ever have questions that come up as you read, if you don't write those down, you will forget them. Write the questions down. Bring the questions in. We can talk about those next time. Okay? Lastly, I would encourage you all, I know I've said this before, but I say all sorts of things. For Wednesday, God help me, those classes, we're going to talk about chapters 3 and 4. If they've read. If not, who knows? Um, but... Uh, I. I would recommend, obviously, that you guys stay up to date on the reading, but also watch that video when I post it, because that's just that's how we have to have the conversation, unfortunately. Um, I guess that's it. I mentioned before, there's no homework. You just got to read. Just keep reading. If you're behind already, well, uh, you have some time to get caught up. I forget what we have to have read for Monday. I think it's just chapter five, but it could be five and six. I can't remember. But, uh, yeah. Do you guys have any questions for me or, or what have you? No? Okay. Well, in that case, I'll see you in a week. Thank you very much.